We do. Okay. Does that help? All right. Well, good afternoon or good evening or good morning, depending upon where you are in the world with this particular case. Uh, this is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore in Scottsdale, Arizona. And we are really delighted to have two of our friends, Dervla McTiernan and Solari Gentle with us this after, well, whenever whenever the heck you're watching it, this evening for us. Uh, and a very stormy one, by the way, in Arizona. Um, uh, Dervla is going to be talking about our brand new book, What Happened to Nina? And, um, and Solari has a brand new book out called The Mystery Writer, which Barbara is holding up. I will go ahead and put uh, links in the comments field. We don't have signed copies because they're halfway around the world, um, but uh, they'll be joining us at some point in the future. Um, yeah. But I'll put links in the comments field if you'd like to order either book. And if you have questions, go ahead and put them in and Barbara will summon me back on screen towards the end of the hour. And I'd be happy to ask any questions you might have. So Lester Holt signing out to Barbara. Thank you very much. I'm listening to scratching on the door. Both both puppies would like to be part of this conversation, <laughs> but we'll see if it gets intolerable. I am so pleased to have a chance to talk to two of my favorite Australians because um, we we did this during COVID and then uh, Durfla actually came to the United States. Sulari came to the United States with her last book called The Woman in the Library. So we haven't kind of done this little gig together again for a little while, have we? No, no, it's, it's so nice it, to be back. Yeah, I think I think it. You're right, Barbara. It was, must have been about two years. Time flies, though. <laughs> no, it really does. And COVID kind of destroyed time anyway. So yeah. um, here we are. Austra um, Solari is closer to us in a time zone. She's on the eastern side of Australia from the United States, and Durbla is farther west. So um, the miracle of Zoom is if we can all figure out time zones, which is the hardest part. Um, and also the right day, because Dirk Love panicked yeah. yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> she missed the whole event. <laughs> I really did. And I was sitting on the couch in my pajamas, if I'm very honest. And all I thought is, oh, my God, I can't turn on a camera right now. I have to do something if this is happening. So, phew. Yeah. So here we are. Um, anyway, um, I'm going to do this in alphabetical order. So the mystery writer, and I have a little flyer here because I don't have all the books, but Sulari, who um, writes my beloved Roland Sinclair historical series, which she hasn't done for a while, which makes me really cross. But anyway, she has now written three books that are um, connected because they have um, a sort of literary writerly background and somewhat metaphysical, although this one really isn't. I think that certainly after she wrote him and the woman in the library to some degree did, but this one is more straightforward. I mean, it's more, more of a kind of standard thriller. I think, you know, more like Lisa Unger or Mary Kubica <laughs> or some of the other people that we have recently talked to. Um, and it's set in Lawrence, Kansas. So ask yourself, why is it? I'll ask Larry, why is it you keep writing books set in the United States when you actually live in Australia? Um, well, for this particular book, uh, the story fitted better in the US. So the background to this story is a, um, a lot to do with, you know, conspiracy theories and doomsday prepping and also very large companies, large agencies and large publishing industries, um, which we you know, have less of in Australia. Uh, so it seemed to fit more naturally in the US. Um, and of course, um, I have I have a an informant in the US who uh, who is happy to share his experience of US um, cities and towns with me. And so I tapped Larry on the shoulder and he was, um, those of you who've heard me talk about the woman in the library uh, might know Larry as the, as the friend who uh, informed me about Boston for the woman in the library. He also um, tapped me into Lawrence, Kansas to write the mystery writer. Aha. Uh -huh. So this is the last book that Larry and, I mean, so Larry and I actually worked together kind of as mm -hmm. editor and author, although... With any luck, it won't be forever. The last book we'll work on together because I'm like doing early stuff with her. And I remember you telling me that um, I remember telling you I didn't think it was working all that well. And you said whatever I said, which I can't remember, was the <laughs> thing that made the book finally work. So can you yeah. remember what it was? Um, 
I think you were, I think it was that extra thread that came in. So when uh, this initially in the first draft, the, the pieces about the conspiracy theories and the taps into the forum. So you see at the beginning of a lot of the um, chapters in that book, there are extracts from uh, what is, you know, a conspiracy theorist's forum. And I don't think that was as explicit in the initial drafts. And I think you were, you were talking about how that didn't connect um, as well, and 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 I needed to bring that uh, further into the uh, into the into the fore so that people knew what I was talking about, uh, instead of just expecting that you know in this post COVID world everybody would understand uh, what hysteria was because people forget very quickly. You come out of COVID, you come out of that kind of lockdown situation, people forget what it was like very, very quickly. And that advice was perfect because that's exactly what happened. Um, people try to throw dark times as far into the background as they can. Um, so I think once I started looking at that, that second uh, or third thread to put into it to make that more explicit, the whole whole book started to work much better. Wonderful. Well, it certainly did, because I really enjoyed reading it all over <laughs> again. I loved it. So, Durfla, Durfla, I could ask you sort of the same question, because, you know, you're Irish living in Australia, and um, and you've written books set back in Ireland in Galway, if I recall. And now, you know, so why is it that you aren't writing books set in Perth? Mine is, my answer is, is, is much less informed that are intelligent and Solari. The first, first book I set in the States was for a good reason. The murder rule was set in Virginia and it had to be set there because of the law that really formed part of the story. Um, with Nina, it was because I wanted to visit Vermont <laughs> and I figured I could get a, a tax deductible research trip out of it if I set the book there. I have a friend who sets all of her books in um, in Paris and uh, New York. And every year she visits either Paris or New York. And I see all her beautiful videos and photographs on Instagram. And I keep thinking, why am I setting books in Galway? I know Galway. I want to go a bit further afield. So I decided on Vermont because it's so beautiful. And the setting really fit the book with this background of sort of hiking and climbing. I'd spent a summer in Maine, but never made it as far as Vermont. So that was my decision. But I didn't check how many flights I'd have to take from Perth to get there, which was four one way and five the other. Um, possibly I would have reconsidered had I realized that. OK, well, um, and so Dirkla, I think, you know, I've liked all your books, but this one, I think, for me anyway, is your best book. It really just knocked my socks off. Um, and it's based upon or it's inspired by, I should say, not based upon. A real event. But what you don't know, probably, is that we have had a very similar parent-child dynamic, parent-crime-committing child dynamic, here in this area, and they're called the Gilbert Goons. And it has been a, um, a remarkable story of a uh, um, number of young men who, um, in the course of gang-like behavior, actually killed a boy. And uh, it went unrecognized for a long time. The police department didn't. And it's clear that the parents did a big cover up and now only beginning to sort of come to light. So this book has a lot of resonance for us living here in that um, much of what's happening in your book, the behavior of the parents, um, has actually happened in real life here in a different context. Mm -hmm. I wasn't aware. I wasn't aware, Barbara, about that. That's that's horrific. I mean, look, I guess it's there's it's easy to see parallels because it's something that keeps happening. You know, and um, that sounds like a very specific case. But more broadly, the cases of young women disappearing or young women being murdered and, and people trying to find answers afterwards. And for me, this book started really when I was having coffee with a good friend of mine. It was those, one of those coffees is supposed to take half an hour. And you're still sitting there three hours later. And I have two children, a daughter and a son, but they're they're still quite young. Whereas my buddy, her son was going off to college and she was talking about her worries for him, you know. And I was like, what are you, what are you worried about? I mean, this is a gorgeous kid, to be clear. Really lovely guy. 
But she was saying, look, the world has changed so fast and we are, what we expect from young men is so different and it's all quite nuanced at times. And like 18 year old boys are not known for grasping nuance, particularly after a couple of beers. And you know, what if he does something stupid or he, he sticks up a friend on social media when he shouldn't? And the kinds of mistakes 18 year old guys make that, you know, they might have learned from a few years ago, apologized and moved on. Her point was sometimes now that's captured on camera or in a screenshot the outrage machine gathers and it's it's something that can follow you forever. And I walked away from that conversation really struck by that. And for the first time thinking about what parents of young men worry about on a night out, because as a woman, I've always been conscious of the risks to women. My older child is a girl. So I've been kind of thinking about that. Hadn't really thought about it from the point of view of a boy. And naturally enough, that kind of leads you to the next stage. Well, what if your son is accused of something a lot more serious than getting some nuance wrong? And you know him and you love him and you absolutely believe in this kid. But this horrific thing he's been accused of, you know, do you go straight to thinking, well, he must have done it? I don't think so. I think you go straight to thinking, of course, he didn't do it. And then what am I going to do to protect him? And then maybe you might get to thinking, well, if anything happened, it was certainly an accident. But I think my instinct as a mother would be protect at all costs. And that made me really start thinking about, well, what if you're the mother of the daughter? What if you're the mother of the son and the natural uh, and father too, or the natural conflict that comes from that, you know? Absolutely. Well, I didn't make it entirely clear that the dynamic I was really referring to was the parents, the parents, you know, cover up the parents' protectiveness, the parents, whatever. And interestingly enough, Lisa Scalini is here tomorrow night, and that is the dynamic in her book, too. Ah. Um, so I, you know, I find that so interesting that we have this real life situation here, and then we have your book, and then we have her book, and basically a lot of it comes down to parenting. You know, what kind of parent are you? Um, and what would you do? if your child was threatened um, and which of your children in her case, which of your children would you believe if mm. one child threw the other child under the bus to protect him? Yes. What would you do yeah. about that? Um, and yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I think That's... parenting worldwide is kind of, you know, being is being questioned at the moment. Mm. And as mm. you point out, the consequences, thanks to social media, are so severe now where once, you know, um, things could be ignored, covered up or forgotten. That's not true anymore. And kids do stupid mm -hmm. stuff, whether they're sexting or whether, you know, they get caught up in a group dynamic and beat some kid to death, you know, and did they actually really mean it? And, you know, all, there's yeah. so many questions. The yeah. Kids make mistakes because they're kids, you know, they haven't grown up yet. And, and and as you say, the power of a group dynamic, the power of being caught up in a moment. And um, and it's really frightening. And then the social media, which you mentioned, Barbara, the fact that it's it can be so spun, so exaggerated, so manipulated, the versions of truth that are out there. And sometimes the version of truth that grows legs is the one that's most exciting, even though it might have no relationship with the truth. So it's a it's an interesting time we're living in. Scary time. Hard to be a parent. Yeah. I'm glad, mm. you know, I'm a great grandparent almost. So, <laughs> you know, here's the thing I learned that grandparents don't have any power at all. <laughs> so, you know, um, that was very hard. Um, a that means no learned. responsibility either, Barbara. That's the good thing. <laughs> well, now it's really not because um, in point of fact, sometimes I think you can see more clearly than the parent. Um, but there's uh, not a damn yeah, thing you can do about it. Right. So the Gabby Potato case uh, is, a real, is a real thing. And I thought that your opening, I mean, it's no surprise that what happened in the book um, is pretty clear from the opening chapter that something terrible is going to happen to Nina because she wants to break off a relationship that um, has clearly become unhealthy. And mm -hmm. the young man is is sort of move past rational behavior. So that's an interesting way to structure the story that, um, you know, you set it out from the outset that mm -hmm. something bad has happened to Nina. And um, mm -hmm. and then, you know, you raveled from there. Um, I thought it was an interesting, did you always know that's the way you wanted to structure the book? 
Yeah, kind of. But there was a bit of, you know, obviously it, it, it did provoke a bit of conversation, a bit of editorial conversation, because there's a risk. You know, you give away big chunks of the story right at the beginning. And then in the middle, there's another big chunk that's given away. And those are the kinds of things that often are kept for the end. And the risk is what keeps the reader turning the pages if you tell them the secrets at the beginning? But for me, it was never even despite the title, which is right there, what happened to Nina? It's never been about what happened to Nina. It's always been about what do the parents do, you know, and this sort of they both from the moment she disappears, their world changes and they're living in this kind of heightened reality um, where it's very intense. They all take one little step sort of off the path and they each take an action that you and I might not take, but that is reasonable in the circumstances. But once they've taken that step, that provokes a response from the other side. And then they take another step and think, and within a week, I mean, only a week passes in the book. I think those parents would look back and not recognize the people they've become. So for me, this story was always going to be about this sort of mutual path of destruction almost between the parents and less about what happened to Nina. So I was comfortable putting that up front, but I wanted one chapter, in this case, the prologue with her voice strongly there because I wanted you to know her and then feel her absence. You know, that was really important. So that's why it starts with with Nina. I think the best books are the ones where you genuinely mourn the victim. And, you know, sometimes victims are kind of straw men or straw women, but not in this case, since we have a chance to already have you. I, I didn't want to put you on the spot because I didn't know for sure whether you'd read this book or not. <laughs> I have. And I, I loved it. Oh, chime the in that, then. Go for it. One of the things that I was going to say about how um, how appropriate and wonderful the title works is that you're not just looking at what happened to Nina in terms of what physically happened to Nina but I kind of as I was reading it was thinking about what happened to Nina to take her from being this strong independent vibrant young woman with the world at her feet to the kind of woman or to the girl who we think allows herself to get into that situation and I thought that was a really interesting play on on the title but also a good way to look at it because we do tend to automatically think and I think there's a self-preservation about it that won't happen to my daughter because she won't let herself get into that situation that won't happen to me because I would never let myself get into that situation and and I like that I, I really found that really interesting and fascinating about uh, that uh, a perfectly functional strong young woman can bit by bit uh, you know, like a, a frog boiling in tepid water, find themselves in that situation. I, I think, uh, thank you, Sari. First of all, I never thought of the title in that way. And I'm absolutely going to steal that from now on when I'm very <laughs> something related. But I, it was so important to me because I think we do judge. And I think there's a reason we judge because we want to think there was a reason that this terrible thing happened. Because if there's a logical reason, then we can protect ourselves and we can protect our loved ones from it. So we look at these young women and we and some part of us quietly judges. But the reality is, for me anyway, when I think about how does this happen, it happens because of love and because of heart. Like you, you love somebody, you're vulnerable and they screw up. They make a mistake. They're rough with you. And your first instinct is to protect them because, you know, if it's if it's known that your boyfriend shoved you or maybe held too hard to your hand or, or you know, cross a line that if your friends know about that, if his friends know about that, he will be, you know, potentially pilloried. So you protect him from that and then you protect him the next time. And suddenly it's your secret. And then there's a bit of shame and people can be very good at manipulating you into blaming yourself. And I, I think even the strongest amongst us will be shocked at the degree to which you can be manipulated when someone just gets in a little bit. Um, and I really wanted to show that Lena is not a victim. She is a whole person with a whole life and it's not her fault you know yeah yeah I, I i thought that i mean that came across from the very first chapter thank you Katie. um because i love nina she's the, exactly the kind yeah. of young woman you want as a daughter the, yeah. the kind of woman young woman with power and a and you know ambition and a fierceness and she didn't seem like a sap or a sop at all and yet no. <laughs> and yet and yet, she, and yet yeah yeah and the thing is, you know, when you're that young, you also do make mistakes. Um, 
Yeah, you, you, just, you should be given the time to, to learn and figure that stuff out. And sometimes you just don't get the time to do yeah. that. But exactly. if, can I um, can I turn the tables on you for a minute? <laughs> if <I'm allowed. laughs> Barbara, is it okay if I hijack this completely? <laughs> no, 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 I'm great. I'm just sitting back here listening. Go. I just, I, I really want to ask Solari about her book because I finished it yesterday and I just loved it, Solari. You know I loved it and I love yeah. all your books. And you always strike me as such an organic writer like I you have to tell me how accurate this is okay but I think you don't write with an outline and yeah. not everybody can do that well like let's be honest but you absolutely bloody can and what I love about it is I never know where it's going to go but I'm confident that I'm in your hands so my question is have you always written like that and does it ever get you in trouble look I've always written like that I'm glad you're confident because I'm not necessarily confident <laughs> I, I sort of I, I always just sit down and I start writing very organically and see where the story goes. It's almost like um, you know unearthing the story rather than writing it. It it yeah. feels like the story is there. I just have to dig it out. Um, but there is always a point two thirds of the way through the book where I sit down and think, uh oh, this <laughs> makes no sense. I don't know where it's going to go. How am I going to get them out of this? Um, and it's at that point that you sort of have to suck it up, gird your loins and keep writing. Um, and and that's, that's always the point of courage. And I think there's always a point of courage in everybody's writing process, whether it's at the beginning or two-thirds of the way in. But for me, that's my point of courage uh, because there is always that wavering point where I think oh, oh I've just wasted the past couple of months and you know 70,000 words that are going to go nowhere because this doesn't make sense <laughs> well, so yes. if it makes you feel any better I've worked I, I often work with outlines and I have also cut 30 40,000 words so it's not it doesn't save you from that completely but I just think that your books are so fresh because of that organic approach and and I know like I just it's going to be a romp like I know I'm going to have fun when I read it, I'm never, ever bored. It's never the same as something else. So keep doing it that way, please. <laughs> Thank you. If, I, I suppose, you know, you never know where it's going to go because I never know where it's going to go. <laughs> it's just a matter of twisting and, um, and letting the characters go where they want to. Um, I always play really close to that line between imagination and delusion. And I let myself believe in the characters as much um, as is possible without being scheduled. Um, yeah. and, uh, and so they seem to have a life of their own and they seem to have will and ambition and wants of their own. Um, so they take over the story and I just run around after them, writing down what they do. Well, I love it. If what we have here is a young woman um, in Australia who... Uh, decides that she doesn't want to accept her assigned role of law student. She has a brother living in Lawrence, Kansas, who is a lawyer. And Theo decides to make a break for it and turns up on his doorstep. Now, this allows Larry to expose the sheer dysfunctionality of publishing and the literary community in yet a different way. Um, and I really enjoyed it. Um, for so many reasons we can't talk about tragically because you know we're going to spoil this we, we, we did talk about that on that train to the badlands <laughs> Just, yeah, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> but you know in many ways i i wish that it were possible to do these kinds of events like a couple of months after the book is published and a requirement for coming um to you know to the conversation would be that people had already read the book so there aren't any spoilers but here we are um, so uh, why is it called the mystery writer? Because there is, in fact, a mystery writer who is at the core of this book. Well, it, it, it's a kind of, that, that also was a play. Um, so the mystery writer is, of course, uh, Theo's ambition is to be a mystery writer. But it's also, uh, if you take it another way, the mystery writer is, is who is the actual writer. Um, and the story story is about that, you know, who who is writing the narrative for society and the narrative by which society gets excited and lives by um, and is, is an author who you think they are. Um, so it, it was a bit of a, a, a play on all of that. But, you know, titles are, <laughs> titles, are titles. They are uh, always a negotiation between oneself and one's publisher. 
Um, and, and I have yes. got notoriously bad at picking my own titles anyway. So I think when I initially submitted this manuscript, it didn't have a title at all um, because I just couldn't think of one. Um, and I was helped to the mystery writer um, and it seemed to fit. Uh, in the end. So I'm glad someone was thinking about it because the things I was coming out up with were ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so it was, it's interesting, but it, I, I always, this when I was reading Derva's book, um, I was struck by uh, the, the coincidence or the, the similarity between what we're talking about in relation to uh, people who get cancelled and people who fall out of public life uh, for creating an offence against, you know, real things and also just offences against public order or public expectation. Um, and I've always wondered what happened to those people. Where did they go? Did you suddenly disappear because you were cancelled? Did you suddenly stop wanting to write? Did you suddenly stop wanting the life that you had before? And what did you do? And um, so where I was approaching the story was, you know, what do these people do? And, of course, what you were looking at the story is the protectiveness to stop those people sinking into that whole um, uh, cancelled area in the first place. Uh, so clearly that new phenomenon of people uh, or, or of, of society decreeing that certain people uh, are not allowed to be who they are uh, is something that's playing on the minds of writers. There's, a, there's an idea you play with, Solari. I hope it's not kind of, um, I don't think it's a spoiler because it's a central kind of idea, but this thinking about narrative being used to manipulate public opinion and people who are skilled at generating narrative getting better and better at that. And I thought that was really interesting because I think that's something we're going to be talking about more and more, you know, people have just realized that if you can spin a good story, it has a lot more impact than something that is connected with fact and reality, which, you know, when you're trying to communicate something that is fact-based, fact you have to go into all the nuance. It can be a bit boring, let's be honest. And often there's a lot of gray. It's not very clear. We're not really sure what the right answer is. Whereas if you can spin a good narrative, it's going to land much harder. And with so much information coming at us all the time, we're attracted to those really clean narratives. I, yeah. I think that's a fascinating idea. Did, did that come from anything in particular for you or was it something on your mind? Uh, look, it was, was something on my mind and sort of looking at, you know, what's been happening of late with, um, you know, conspiracy theories and alternate facts and interpretations that once upon a time people would have dismissed as ludicrous but seem to be getting airplay mm -hmm. nowadays. And I was always also intrigued with the idea that one thing that conspiracy theories do is they make the reader the protagonist. They make the reader the hero of the story. You you are part of it. You you have to grab your flag and run to Capitol Hill, um, and you you can stop it. You can do something about this terrible wrong that's being done. And I and I wondered when that shifted. Uh, when you know this when it when we move from reading books uh, and getting involved in someone else's story to wanting the story to be about us. Mm. Um, and so I was quite, I'm quite intrigued with that change in society. Um, you know, my, my, my husband is certain that it's the advent of video games that made us, <laughs> uh, <laughs> made us the centre of the story. And, and, you know, there may be something to that. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I've always been an observational writer rather than a, a, an autobiographical writer. And I, I'm, I'm finding the changes in society and how we're working and how we're looking at things quite, quite interesting. I don't know where it'll go, um, but I'm interested in recording and making sure that it's noticed that we are changing. Do you have a theory of why that, we're drawn? Sorry, Barbie. No, no, no. I was just going to say, I think it's interesting that all three of us have legal training and therefore, you know, we are sort of fact-based and we expect things to progress in a, we, we expect a structure and order and we expect things to be, and, you know, for a long time, crime fiction was really more about that investigation, you know, the privatized story, the police procedure and all, you know, it was a, I mean, with the occasional diversion from Agatha Christie, whatever, basically, you know, you started with some sort of an incident and you worked your way towards a conclusion. And the reader was 
part of the fun was see if the reader could get to the right conclusion before the author told you what the right conclusion was, right? But then we got, you know, we got, um, I can't blame Gillian entirely, but we got Gone Girl. And now, you know, the whole thrust, I mean, because I've done so many of these events lately with unreliable narrators and twists in the story and nobody is who you think they are when you meet them, you know, when you get to the end, um, which is, to some degree, what you're talking about, both of you in this is, you know, the people we meet are not necessarily who they are yeah. when, we, when we get mm -hmm. to the end. Um, and justice is malleable. Very malleable. Um, and it's not always meted out in, um, you know, a more formal way. Um, in a way, you know, these flash mobs and internet stuff can inflict a kind of justice that you know maybe just arrest by the ordinary forces of law and order you know don't provide yeah. so i i think as readers more readers have come to expect a certain unreliability or you know change um an expectation maybe that the people we meet at the beginning of the story are not who they are ultimately yeah. Whether they're transformed or whether they were always not who they are, you know, that's a that's an interesting thing because Derp, I think yours is about about transformation, don't you? Mm -hmm. That the people, the parents, when we meet them, they probably are one kind of person, but the events, um, they they transform them into people mm -hmm. they may not even recognize by the time. Mm -hmm. Well, probably don't. In fact, definitely don't. In one case, mm -hmm. by the time we get to the end, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I just think it's the the intensity. I mean, you take something that we always think of as so positive and, you know, almost pure, which is the love of a parent for a child, but then you put it under a position of so much pressure in such an intense situation, it becomes one of the most dangerous things, I think. You know, I, again, just referencing our legal training, the thing that always struck me when I was a lawyer many years ago now, thankfully, is, you know, you have this fiduciary duty to your client. So you have an obligation to do what's best for your client all the time. And what I thought was interesting is the awful things that lawyers would do for clients that you would never do in your personal life, because in your personal life, you're bar you're balancing different moral goods, you know, so you yeah. think, well, it's in my best interest to do this, but it's actually terrible for my neighbor. So, you know, I have to kind of consider their needs as well. When you're a lawyer, your job is to consider the need of your client. So, I mean, I remember even back when we were being trained, I, I was never a family lawyer, but one of the things they talked about is, look, please have some consideration, please moderate your tone when you write these letters, you know, it's more problematic in family law to be quite as aggressive as we might be in commercial law, etc. And I, I was always struck that that I, I think it's a dangerous and damaging thing in our society that that this is the, the, the driving thing behind lawyers, obviously, there's an ethical balance as well, but mostly you're just putting your client first, and that will justify anything. And I think that translates a little bit to parenting a child. You know, your your love for your child is so central to who you are and it's so acceptable to just put your child's interests first. And I think, again, you take something like that that is at first glance only good, but then you supercharge it and it can become ugly. Yeah. Yeah. Very and, well. then, and, it, and it starts from a, an earnestness. I, I, I was talking to someone um, quite recently about the whole Gen X parenting and the Gen Y parenting where we are much more observant and much more integrated into the lives of our children than, say, our parents were. And, you know, people talk nostalgically and with fondness about the times when your children were allowed to, you know, run free in the morning and come home before dark, which is the way I grew up. But nowadays, we're much more invested in making sure our children do their homework. My parents didn't know what homework I had. <laughs> it was just not, it was not an issue. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's nowadays, you, it's, it's almost competitive parenting, uh, where you feel, you feel judged as a parent by how well your child does. And so we're, we're again, seeing a difference in society. And I think that also brings forth this this extra fierceness i think people always defended and fought for their kids uh like lionesses and lions but um but nowadays there's this added element of competitive parenting putting in how good a parent are you what are you willing mm -hmm. to do for your child mm -hmm. um and that that makes the issue all the more complicated and and troubling mm -hmm.
That's very yeah. true. But you know, the other part of that too is that the more the more you parent your child, the less your child learns to take care of himself or herself. Absolutely. And I think that that in, it's an infantilizing kind of a thing in many ways. And so I think that leads us with more kids, the Gilbert Goons I've described, appear to be a classic of that, you know, that um, I don't think they anticipated any real consequences to their behavior because they knew their parents, you know, were going to have their back um, and they haven't formed any kind of moral compass of their own as a consequence. Like so I think it's a very, yeah. a very dangerous thing to be that kind of a parent and you wind and, up with a child who can't be a full adult. And society is adapting to accommodate that. I noticed um, my, my, my youngest son just went off to university at the ANU. Um, so it's, it's a few hours away. So he lives on campus, et cetera. Now, um, my husband and I are both graduates of, of the ANU. It, it's not the kind of um, uh, varsity sort of loyalty that you have in the US. It just so happens that the ANU is the nearest university to where we live. But um, I remember when I went to university, you had your parents drop you off, you know, uh, 250 metres outside the university and you went there yourself. You would never allow your parents on campus. Now they have a parents' day where they welcome the parents onto campus so they, they can see where their children are living and, and so on. And I, I was really intrigued by the change uh, where, where it has got to a point where now even the university is accommodating the, uh, the exorbitant interest of parents in, their, in, the, in the lives of their college-aged children. But here's an interesting thing that's happened here is that um, we just had two trials, mother and father, uh, convicting both of them um, for careless parenting in the sense that they allowed their mentally disturbed child, you know, uh, they actually bought him a gun and he wound up, you know, killing people. It was horrible. And this is the first time that I can recall that the legal system in this country decided to hold the parents responsible as well. You know, mm -hmm. the kid's gone away for life, but they have now really slammed. And I'm wondering if there's going to be more of a shift now to holding parents. They're careless parents. They're not the kind of parents that you were talking about, but, mm -hmm. you know, holding parents more accountable for bad parenting, whether it's too strict or too casual. That was the conversation in We Have to Talk About Kevin, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. About I, I can see it happening, Barbara. I, I think that as, you know, Sudar has been talking about that shift in parenting and this sort of, you know, this huge increase in engagement. I grew up exactly like you, Solari. My parents had no clue what was going on at school. We dropped our school bags at the door when we came in, we went out to play and we came home whenever. And that was just the way we grew up. And, and now it's so different. I know exactly what's happening at kids' schools. I know what homework they have. We have apps, you know, where I can click in and see what assignments are due and I'm encouraged to do that. It's crazy. But that's the new life. And the thing is, if the if the societal norm is one way, it's very hard to fight the flow. For example, walking to school. Well, my kids in primary school, we lived in a very nice, very safe neighborhood. Um, and one of the parents let her, I think she was possibly eight, eight-year-old daughter walk to school. It was two blocks in a very safe neighborhood and everybody was shocked. And in a way, I got why people were concerned because she's the only little girl walking to school by herself because no other kid did it. And so you you stand out and you suddenly feel you're at risk because you're the only one who's doing that, even though we should all be doing it, certainly. The only thing I will say in our slight defense of our Gen X parenting is I did read an article in the New York Times the other day where they were saying that there had been some uh, study and they found that actually, you know, young adults who grew up with this kind of parenting where the parents were really engaged were, you know, quite happy and enjoyed their relationship with their parents. And it was a largely positive experience. So I don't know, maybe there's a bit of balance. Maybe we're not screwing <laughs> it up completely. That's all I'll say. <laughs> oh, no. well, that's very hot. <laughs> right. So, so Ari, I want to go back to the mystery writer because we've talked about Theo who arrives on the doorstep of her of her surprise brother. And Lawrence, Kansas, announcing that she is not going to continue law school. Um, but then she meets up with an actual published and very renowned mystery writer who, um, by chance, if I remember right, in a coffee shop. And um, 
and then he becomes her mentor. So that's an important relationship. Did you, Dervla, expect the the way this story turned out? Were you surprised by? Yes, I was massively surprised. I I I mean, some of it I kind of you could see because you're supposed to see it, you know. But some okay. of it I didn't, and it escalates very quickly towards the end. But I mean, the gorgeousness of Theo's relationship with her brother, I loved that. I, I loved Mac and I really liked that he turned out to be a Cormac, which I wasn't expecting. Um, but that whole relationship and, and you know, Theo is a young writer growing in confidence and having this mentor. I don't want to, if I, if, you know, if I keep talking, I'm going to give away spoilers, which I don't want to do. I know, but no, I would say that for anybody who reads the book, you know, be prepared for it to escalate very quickly in the last like fifths, I would say. Would you agree, Solari? Yeah. That's about when it kind of goes pchum. Um, and it takes you in unexpected directions. And here's my question for you, Solari. Is there going to be a sequel? <laughs> I wasn't intending for there to be a sequel, partly because there's still more Roland Sinclair books to write. The Roland Sinclair readers will kill oh, me. If thank you. <laughs> yes, me among them. I want him back from Boston, damn it. And it's yes, also yeah. girls. My title, um, I might say, which I stole from another, another author. But... Um, I really want them back in Australia. There's so much more to go. So I hope you can work them in as you're writing other things. Oh, look, it's, I've got the next book half finished, but I, I sort of gave myself a break. And I think you said this to me, that 10 was a good place to break mm -hmm. and people would forgive me for writing other books for a little while uh, and, and breaking the series there. So I gave myself a break and permission to write other things. Um, with always with the knowledge that I would go back to Roland um, okay. and that there was much more that he had to say and do before he was done. But, yes, the thing is I, 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 wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't start another series because I think I would get an angry letters <laughs> if, if I abandoned Roland to start another series. I think they'll tolerate me doing a few standalones, uh, but uh, nothing more than that. <laughs> Well, we'll see, you know, I mean, who knows um, how it will go. But I, I do think, you know, speaking as an American, I have learned so much from reading Roland Sinclair books about um, the 1930s and the war that um, never really came to our attention because we are so Eurocentric um, in our approach to World War II here, uh, or, we're, or we're over there, in, you know, in the Pacific, with Japan, yeah. but I don't think that many Americans really think much about um, what was happening in Australia um, in the 30s and, you know, during the war. And, you know, it was really a revelation to me. I learned so much from you, and I hope that um, other people, you know, like me, did too, and will want to know more. Well, thank you. Oh, look, I learned a lot from that series as well because, you know, um, as we spoke about before, I don't research a book before I start to write it. I research as I write. Uh, so I start with an idea and I keep going and as something comes up. So in the process of writing the Roland Sinclair books, I learned my own history um, and, and discovered things that, you know, I, I knew in a vague way but not in depth and, and progressively became more and more fascinated by, particularly since, you know, um, in the current era we're in, we seem to be repeating a lot of the mistakes uh, mm. that back okay. then. Um, and so I'm quite intrigued. I've always been quite intrigued about whether there was a point where we could have stepped off, um, basically in the hope that there's a point now where we can step off. Um, I haven't found it yet, but I'm ever no. hopeful. The world's a very dangerous place again. There's no question about it. So, you know, I mean, it's historical fiction, I think, is very comforting because we know how it came out. Uh, living yeah. through it is a very, I often point out to Jane Austen readers that while all that was going on, England was engaged in a 20 year war and nobody knew how it was going to come out until Waterloo. And even then, it was kind of tense. Um, and yet, you know, that doesn't come across in all of the, you know, the wonderful Regency romances and all the rest of it. You would have no idea how scary a time that must have been. Um, and here we are. And um, are you going to go back to, to Galway or are you decided now you want to see the rest of the world and you're not going to? Who knows? I feel Paris next. 
<laughs> no, um, I, yeah, I haven't, we haven't announced it, but I'm working on a Cormac book at the moment. So, well, um, you are. Yeah, I just had to wait, yes. you know, you know, you just have to wait for the right story. I didn't want to write a book just to write a book. Um, mm. And the, the three kind of felt like they were together. And there was a, a while where I wasn't sure if I was going to go back. But then I, I had an idea and I just thought, oh, this is such a good fit for a Cormac story. And then I just felt ready to write it. And honestly, it was fun. I mean, it was just fun to write it. It was such a breath of fresh air. It was it was really comfortable and it was just a joy. I had fun with it. So I'm working on getting it organized now to send off to my editor in a few weeks. And uh, yeah, it's been a joy. Oh, yeah. good. Well, I mean, I think, you know, both of you are doing a good thing and that, you know, you're, you're writing a series that you love, but you're also stepping away and, you know, refreshing yourself and giving us other stories. It, I'm not sure that readers are often understand that, um, you have to you have to have a story that fits a series, you know. That if you get a great idea, but it doesn't work for Roland or it doesn't work for Carmack, you know, what are you going to do? Do you just suppress the idea, or do you write something yeah. different? Yeah, I think it's staying fresh and and following the story keeps the joy in it. You know, I when I open the cover of a Stephen King book and I see that list of books he's written, and I think you know he he only I mean there is no reason for him to write other than the joy of it. And there's been no yep. reason for him to write other than the joy of it for 20 years. And, and he's still writing. And I, I think it's because he, he writes where the story takes him. And I think you can feel that on every page. And so I, I'd love to, I think you have to earn that privilege in today's publishing world, but I'd like to earn that privilege and be able to write where the story takes me. Yeah. And the joy, sorry, Samari, go ahead. I was just going to say that the, the joy in actually writing a book, like the joy you're feeling with the latest Cormac and the joy I feel every time I go back to Roland, um, it's something that no one can take away from you. Awards, sales, all of that is is in the hands of readers and other people and they're never, ever guaranteed. But if you can find joy in putting one word after another and one sentence after another to make a story, well, that's something that you have forever uh, and that can never be taken away from you. Um, so that's where I always try to go back to when I write to, to finding joy in the actual process, in the actual creation of story. Well, I think it comes across, you're right. If you're not having a good time, the reader, you know, if you're not loving it, the reader will probably sense it. So both of you have American publishers now. Solari, when I first met her, was um, had an Australian publisher. And Dervla, I'm trying to remember, who published your first two or three books with Cormac? It was a bit of a mix. So it was HarperCollins in Australia and Penguin in the US and uh, Little Brown in the UK. And so then I, so I've had a mix of publishers in different countries at different times. So my most recent contract has been with William Morrow. So still with my original Australian publisher, but more, more of a global contract out of New York um, is where it sits at the moment. So how is the Australian publishing world? I mean, it's clearly it will be smaller than, you know, the US here, but um... uh, it's you must right. have devoted readers all across your own country, you know. So are you it's, writing it's, for them or are you writing for the world? Or are you writing for the U.S. or are you just writing? I guess I'm just writing. I mean, look, Australian publishing has been incredibly good to me. I was very lucky. Um, I've been with the same team with Harper since the beginning and they could not have been more supportive. My new book, which just came out four weeks ago here, has been number one for three and a bit weeks. I'm not sure if it's number one for week four yet. We'll see. Um, I had a tour where we had amazing events, where we had you know really big events that were really well attended, and people are just hugely supportive. Even though the accent is a giveaway, I'm not originally Australian. <laughs> Australian people have accepted me, which is nice, and I'm seeing myself referred to now in in papers as Irish Australian, which is lovely. Um, so look, there's something very special about the Australian publishing industry. I don't know if Solari will agree, but we've got a really strong independent bookstore community. We've got two good book chains, really strong book chains, um, as well as online stores and so on. And we've got a good reading culture, you know? I mean, I think it can always be built on for sure. I'd like to see us talking about books a bit more. I think Ireland has a very strong reading culture, so I think we could probably keep building. Um, yeah. But I feel like I was very lucky that this is where I was published first because it was the best possible beginning, you know? Hmm. I, I, I think the I think the same. I started off with uh, an Australian publisher, and uh, whilst I will admit that moving to my American publisher has meant that everything's got bigger, sales, everything is 
you know, uh, tenfold in scale or hundredfold in scale, really. Um, there is something that you get from being a quiet midlist author that is a, a, a kind of a, a learning of your own craft. And I'm so, so I, I'm really grateful for the years that I spent simply as an Australian author trying to hone my craft and trying to work out what it was I wanted to say and how I was going to say it so that now uh, when things are much bigger <laughs> and uh, and it's more on a world scale, I'm ready um, and I'm not terrified. Yeah. So, Dorothy, you wouldn't know this, but I, at least I don't think you would, but um, I met Sulari's work, not Sulari, at the Frankfurt Book Fair in the first year when I wandered up to the Australian publisher section, my eye fell upon a couple of Roland Sinclair books and they looked interesting, but um, uh, I was distracted and whatever. So I went away. And then the next year I went back up to the Australian publishing section of the giant Frankfurt book fair in Frankfurt, Germany. Mm -hmm. And there were, there were Solari's books and there was one more. And I thought, <laughs> aha, I really should investigate these. And so, so I did. Um, but, you know, it was almost serendipity, wasn't it, Sir Larry, that I found your books in Frankfurt. And, um, you know, when I read them, became captivated. Um, I've always loved well, our, and, our origin story. It's always been one of my favorites. Absolutely. And, and you know, there's, uh, as I've always said, Barbara has this amazing eye as an editor. So... You know, when you're talking about mentoring, you're just not mentored by other writers. You're mentored by editors as well. And Barbara's certainly been that for me. Um, because, you know, Barbara doesn't, you know, when she looks at your book, she doesn't talk a lot, but what she says really matters. <laughs> and uh, what she says can really, really change a book. And so that's, you know, one of the things that um, I've, I learned from you is that, that value of having a really good eye and and also knowing that when someone says something that is really right about your book, you recognize it. You don't fight it because you know. And somewhere somewhere deep inside you as a writer, you know. <laughs> and it's almost like you've tried to get it past them. <laughs> but when they pull it out, you think, yeah, okay, I knew that. <laughs> it's, um, so it's it's wonderful when you you meet that kind of um, um, shared. Uh, creative soul where you can actually work together um, on a piece of art um, to make it better. Well, it's been I a joy from my side too. Now, Dervla, I didn't come to your books that way. I came to your books because one of my staff at the Poison Pen was so in love with it that he hand sold a copy of your first book to every person that he could find. And <laughs> as I kept watching myself reordering vast quantities of these books, I thought maybe I should read one, you know, just, I mean, if it's that. And, and so, you know, it was interesting. That was an, an example, you know, of another reader bringing me to you and my respecting the other reader enough, you know, to think, well, okay. okay give it a go. Is that crazy about it? Then, you know, we'll see. I love the way that we come to books. I love the way that we come to authors. There is no formula for it. Mm. And so what we have now in this conversation, we're calling Patrick up to talk about it, is we have these two absolutely amazing books. Um, clearly, I mean, I don't have a favorite of Suari's books, but I'm too, you know, invested in, in many of them. But I definitely am thinking that this is my favorite by far, not by far, my favorite of Durbless books, because it's, it's just on every level, it's so superb. So congratulations. Thank wow. Thank you so oh, much. It's been wonderful. Patrick, come and talk to us and see if we have questions from the audience. There you are. What a great discussion. Yeah. Well, you've got people from all over the globe tuning in. Quite a few Aussies, I must say, from oh, various good. parts of the country. Um Let's see. Here's a question from Robin, which is, uh, this is for both of you. Does the se the change in the seasons uh, affect your writing? Mm. Uh, I was asked this question just recently for a, uh, an interview where they said, what's your perfect day? And my perfect day is midwinter. I like the cold. I like it to be snowing outside. Um, but I like the boys to be out tobogganing 
<laughs> out of the house and and someone to have lit the fires and to have nothing to do but to write. Um, so winter does affect me because I love it so much. I, I think my productivity goes up. See, Larry, I love winter too. I don't know if it's the Irish person in me, but I need a fire on, which is very hard in Perth because, you know, <laughs> summer here is can be 38 degrees to 40 plus Celsius. And then winter, you know, if we get below 15, we're really excited. Oh, it's cold today. <laughs> So um, I really miss that. And for writing, I have to say, I don't know, something about writing crime fiction or thrillers. I want the moody lighting. I want it to be dark. I want it to be cold. I want the clouds to hang low. I think that's why I've been slower to write a lot in Australia, because here in Perth, it's big sky, you know, big blue open sky and sunshine. And and we don't have a lot of very tall trees in Perth. So it's it, to me, it doesn't feel like the right place for a crime novel. I it's a silly prejudice, but there you go. <laughs> okay, here's a question for Dervla. Uh, how did you decide to use the names Nina and Simon? Do you know that there's uh -huh. an American author by the name Nina Simon? <laughs> uh -huh. Well, actually, she was Lola all the way through the book, and everybody liked the title, which they don't always. Um, that was my working title, What Happened to Lola?, and then I told my editor, Anna Valdinger, who was with Harper, and Anna really liked it. And she was talking to Catherine Milne, who happens to be Trent Dalton's editor. And Trent is a very, very, if you don't know, he was a fabulous, fabulous writer and probably one of our very best selling writers in Australia. And Catherine said, no, it can't be what happened to Lola because Trent's book was coming out two months before mine. And his is called Lola in the Mirror. We can't have oh. Lola's everywhere. <laughs> so at that point, she became Nina. And I, I I can't remember Simon. You know, I do spend a lot of time with character names because I do think they really matter, whether it's just to ground the character in you, but I think also for the reader. So I probably would have spent some time considering and rejecting other names, but I, I can't recall now that one's lost. So you did a global find and replace of uh, Lola yeah. and Nina? <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, well, there, there are a number of really interesting comments about, you know, the dis earlier in the discussion, you were talking about parenting and Gen X parenting in particular. Um, and Jell, A-J-E-L, one of our, our faithful viewers, she says, as a teacher, the difficulty is the fact that is the fact that parents do not step back to think that there is another version of the story and their child may have reformed their telling of an event to put themselves in a better place with parents. But then the parents attack the teacher before asking their side of the story. Mm. That's interesting. You know, it's yeah. funny. I don't know about you guys, but my parents would never have taken my side against the teacher. <laughs> you know, yeah. that, that's, that's a totally different yeah. <laughs> thing. You know? yeah. Never. Yeah, that's something that's very much changed. And, and you know, it, it just goes to show you that, you know, kids are natural storytellers too. So, yeah. <laughs> um, they they provide some very good alternate facts <laughs> they do and it reminds us that everyone wants to be the hero of their own story yeah. and therefore you know the story yeah. is going to make sure that that is what comes across yeah. absolutely hmm. oh there's also a comment requesting uh dervla that you move to melbourne i'm not sure why <laughs> <laughs> well actually this is because the weather in Melbourne would be more my cup of tea. It gets colder and it rains. Um, so, yeah, but no, we're, we're very much stuck in the Wild West. This is home now. Culturally, we fit in the West, in, in the far West of Australia, the same way we fit in the far West of Ireland, I think. Yeah. Right. And somebody's makes the comment about uh, definitely Gothic Tasmania. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that would be a good place to set a book. That's right. Jane Harper yeah. set one of her books in Tasmania. Um before yeah. the book before this, whatever the last one was, right? Yeah. yeah. I would love to go to Tasmania. Okay. I've always been sorry that we oh, were going to take a cruise that went from Sydney on New Year's Eve to Tasmania and then all the way down to the Arctic from, you know, in your uh, hemisphere. Uh, I've already been there from our hemisphere and I'm, I'm so crushed that COVID nipped it and, mm -hmm. you know, it hasn't come back. So I lived I lived in Tasmania for a couple of years when I was a lawyer. Um so I can certainly attest to this wonderful gothic undercurrent uh that runs through the island. Um I mean there's also some wonderful bright normal 
non-Gothic aspects of the Tasmanian River. <laughs> <laughs> but but you will certainly will find lots of fodder for crime stories in Tassie. By the way, for the Australian audience, I confirmed today um, that I'll be talking to Michael Robotham, one of my favorite people, Yay. on July 1st at... Um, noon no 10 a.m australian time yes and michael i know he's a wonderful writer and he's given you i think um a quote one yep. one or both of you um he's been one of my favorite people we've only had him i think once to the store because he was in england for a long time as you know and then went back yep. but anyway zoom's a great thing so we get to talk to people that practically speaking are not likely to come to scottsdale so yay anything else patrick uh, a lot of a lot of Cormac fans are very excited about this news. Oh, um, I, yeah. And, uh, My publisher will probably kill me. We we're supposed to make an official announcement, but anyway, there you go. Uh, <laughs> Jen Jen, uh, Jen says, uh, "I really hope you keep uh, Aoife McMahon as your narrator." Is that right, Aoife? Did I say it right? Yeah, Aoife is um, fabulous, and I, I will do everything I possibly can to make sure that happens. Yeah, it would be great. Um, Ken Bruin has just published a new book here in the States. You know, he writes about very dark books set in yeah. Galway. Patrick, Galway. Patrick is a fan. And yeah. I've been there two or three Ken. times. I love the Wild Atlantic Way. Um, okay. uh, that, that whole part of Ireland is so beautiful. My husband bought a tweed last time we were in Galway, which he wears and which he absolutely loves. And if I had my way, I would spend a week every year at Ashford Castle. Oh, Ashford is gorgeous. Oh. Yeah, you have good taste. Very good taste, Barbara. Yeah. Is that you know what made makes the west of Ireland so special? You know that kind of, the whole Gael talked area, and is yeah. that really kind of slowly disappearing? Is it or is Gael talked's been around for look? It's been the same for a long time. I think it's it's you know there are people. So for anybody listening who doesn't know, the Gael talk there is is part. There's small sections of Ireland where the main language spoken is still Irish or Gaelic, as we would say. Right. And so uh, people, you know, the, the signpost will be in Irish. People will speak in the shops in Irish. And Irish kids have to learn Irish from, you know, age five to 17, 18 when they leave school. You, you'll have an Irish class every single day. And usually Jeez. once at least, if not a couple yeah. of times, you go and you live in the Gaeltacht for a couple right. of weeks with other kids and you speak Irish. And I think that that the fact that we're really committed that everybody learns Irish at least until they do leave school um, and the fact that people go back to the Gale Tucks and the fact that the support there is helpful I think the larger issue is that all of rural Ireland is shrinking you know people are going to the cities so most small towns have lost their pubs and their <laughs> post office and their shops and so it's hard there are no jobs there he is <laughs> I thought he was going to scratch his way right through the door so I gave up Hello. what's his name Barbara Sugari is very fond of Scooter, yeah. right? Oh, he's yes. gorgeous. You know? yes, yes. Sweetie. He's a good puppy. His little <laughs> sister, the dark one, is down there on the floor oh. trying to check on things. So there we go, <laughs> right? I'm sorry. Um, I, I know no, I interrupted. No, no, this way no. Stand no. It anymore. no, listen, it's always a highlight when the dog goes Scooter's in. the timekeeper. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, he really is. Um, I think there's probably very little paint left on the outside of my office door because they can <laughs> oh, open down here and do that. Patrick, is there anybody else that we are not paying attention to that would like to ask a question? Um, probably, but let me see. Okay. Um, yeah, the last one will be from Julie. And she she's asking Durable, but I think it applies to Solari as well. Which of your books to date do you think would make the, the best movie? I'm paraphrasing slightly, but oh, that's such a tricky yeah. one. Um, I think that there are two and I'm going to cheat and say two, but I think two and it probably more limited series than movie. Um, I think Nina is very cinematic in that sense. So I think that one and, and The Ruin to me, because but then The Ruin is always going to be very close to my heart. It's my first book. There's a lot in there that I really care about. And I think it could make a very powerful story. So Hopefully, watch this space. We'll see what happens in the next year or so. Um, for me, uh, look, I, I was told a while ago that the Roland Sinclair series being um, historic would be very expensive to make, so don't set my heart on it. Uh, so wiping out the Roland Sinclair books, um, I... I, I'm going to pick two as well. <laughs> the, the mystery writer is a really straight cinematic narrative uh, with that, you know, with 
that pickup of uh, tension and uh, big scenes. But uh, if you had a really, really clever director, I would love to see someone try to make after she wrote him. Uh, but I don't know how they do it, but it would have to be someone who was really clever to work out how to do that dual narrative um, and, um, and make it work. I've lost you all. I can't hear anymore. No, no. I, nope. We're just being very quiet. Yeah. There we go. Okay. I, I muted it because the dogs, the dogs were, um, can you hear me now? Yeah. No, nope, I went away. Well, anyway, wherever I went, um, I was going to mention that for if you're in Australia, that Sulari's after she wrote him was called Crossing the Lines there, in case that's confusing. Yeah. They, I, they've republished it as after she wrote him again here in Australia. So they decided to... Um, well, they did okay, but yeah. you won. You won a terrific award for you yeah. know for the book Literally. is crossing the lines. So yeah. it just dupes people into writing two copies. I mean, they, you know, <laughs> they buy an extra copy, so why not? <laughs> great, exactly. so great. Yeah, so right. All right, so um, that's it, Patrick. Yeah, I think so. Okay, well, thank you, ladies. It's been oh gosh, we went an extra half hour from normal. So thank you all for your patience and watching it. If you stuck to the end. Um, there will also be a, a podcast made of the soundtrack of this, which you can refer people to. And um, anybody who wasn't able to attend, these the video will stay up like forever. Um, and so you can watch it anytime. We find most people actually watch this in the morning over morning coffee, not necessarily live while we're doing it. So we have the mystery writer and we have what happened to Nina. And we hope that both authors will come and see us sometime in the near future. But in the meantime, without a signature, the book will still read just as well as it does with a signature. So buy your copy. Right. <laughs> good night, ladies. Or in your case, Thank good you. afternoon and good night, everybody in the U.S. For, thanks for joining us. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Bye guys. Good night. Bye. That was a lot of fun, you guys. Thanks. Thank it you was. so much. That was really fun.